Our bodies used to seek out flavors of food that were good for us, but author and journalist Mark Schatzker says that there are so many chemicals in processed food that we've thrown off our body's natural flavor instincts. Food journalist Mark Schatzker is the author of The Dorito Effect, The Surprising New Truth About Food and Flavor, and he's here with us again this evening. Hello. So you totally killed the chicken for me last night. I never want to eat chicken uh, again. I shouldn't say that. It's a bit unfair to the chicken. But I want to talk about today, not about sort of the process of how we got today with things like chicken and, and all kinds of produce, but, but, but about flavor and where it all sort of started for us. And you talk about this in your book. You say there's an evolutionary reason for flavor. What is a, it? A big one. Yeah. Uh, and we've totally missed it. We've totally ignored it. Um, if you think about your genome, this is your instruction set. Imagine it as a manual, the manual to make PIA. The biggest chapter, the most exhaustive set of instructions is to make your flavor sensing apparatus, which is your nose and mouth, which are basically chemical sensors. Um, the nose is the really important one. Your mouth senses what are called the basic tastes, salty, sweet, umami, bitter, sour. The nose plays an enormous role in the way food tastes. We, we don't think of it because we taste it in our mouths, but what essentially happens is when you eat food, aromas essentially go down your throat and up that hole in the back of your throat and enter your nasal cavity where there are aroma receptors. There's about 10,000 of them, 400 different kinds, and what they do is perceive chemicals. They catch different parts of chemicals, whether it has to do with shape or polarity. It's extremely complex and they send signals to your brain. And these signals are essentially patterns of neurons firing, and that's how your brain perceives the chemicals in the food it eats. Okay, so let's use an example. I put a piece of chicken in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Say I haven't seasoned my chicken with anything. Um, it sends these aromas to the back of my nose, it sends to my brain, my brain says, hmm, chicken. Exactly. Is it any difference if I took a teaspoon of chicken flavoring? Does my brain say the same thing, hmm, chicken? No. It's the same thing. It creates the, the same effect. The flavoring's, I would argue, an illusion. And the only way you can understand that being an illusion is to understand why we have this flavor apparatus in the first place. Well, the fact that it takes up so much DNA is telling us something, that it's really important. Evolution is very lean, and you don't have something if you don't need it. So if this is taking up more pages of DNA than anything else, it must be really important. And the question is, why is it there? And the answer is that when we were animals, uh, hunter-gatherers, when we lived in a natural state, we had to feed ourselves, and we had to feed ourselves well. We face this interesting problem in that we have diverse nutritional needs. We don't need one thing. We don't just need calories. We don't just need protein. We need calories. We need protein. We need vitamins. We need minerals. There's all sorts of foods that we need to survive. If we don't get them, we're going to die. We face this other problem that the foods that we get this from are also very diverse. There's no single source of minerals. Mm -hmm. That's just like a mineral block and there's no protein block. We get them in, in different, differing amounts from an unimaginable variety of potential food sources. Some of them are a little bit poisonous. Some of them are very poisonous. How do we do that? How do we sort out what we need and actually get it? And the answer is flavor. Um, it's how our bodies recognize and remember where the nutrients are. Uh, there was an incredible series of experiments at, the, at Utah State University that demonstrated how this system works in goats. I'll give you a quick example. They're complex, bizarre experiments, but okay. they're so interesting. Um, a, a behavioral ecologist named Fred Provenza, he took two pens of goats and he made them deficient in phosphorus. He gave them a diet that had everything they needed, but not phosphorus, which is an essential mineral. You need it for like cellular metabolism and your brain needs it, bones need it. And over time, these goats became deficient in phosphorus. They became, this was a huge stress in their bodies. If it continued, they were gonna die. Mm. What he then did is he exposed them to flavorings. One day, he'd give them feed uh, that was a special feed that was flavored like coconut. And then at, right after they ate the coconut flavored feed, he'd put a tube down their throat and drench their stomach in phosphorus. So they experienced the flavor of coconut and then nutritionally they got coconut. What he was trying to do is set up an association in the body so that when the brain tasted coconut, it got phosphorus. The next day he would do it with maple. But when he did it with maple, they wouldn't get phosphorus. They would only get water. Okay. So then later on, when the, um, 
he would give them a choice. They were still phosphorus deficient. What would you like, coconut or would you like maple? And the goats would always go for the coconut. Even though there was no actual phosphorus in the coconut, it was the association. He put it in the stomach while putting the flavor in right, their mouth. Right, so the, we tricked the goats to think that coconut gave them what their bodies were craving. They, they learned that when I eat coconut, I get phosphorus. Now you might be thinking, well maybe goats just like coconut, because mm. who doesn't love coconut? Well that's why he had the second pen, because over in that pen he switched it. Maple was associated with phosphorus and coconut was associated with water. And what did those goats like? They liked the maple. So what he demonstrated is that we have this ability to link up flavors with the nutrients that they indicate. And goats do a really good job. They have the same problem as we do. They live out in the mountain, there's all these different kinds of plants growing. How do they get what they need? And the answer is flavor. What a goat considers delicious is what the goat needs. And they have an unbelievable ability to do this. Sheep can be infected with a parasite and they will eat a tannin that cures them of the parasite. They would never eat this tannin ordinarily, but they, when they get the parasite, they eat it and their parasite load diminishes. Mm. So their, their flavor system can not only nourish them, it can cure them. But don't forget, sheep don't know what uh, parasites are. They don't know what tannins are. They're just nibbling this stuff going, this tastes good. Mm. That's why food tastes good, is because it's giving us something that we need. Okay, uh, so um, I wanna connect sort of what our brain is doing, the evolutionary thing that you talked about, um, and then how it connects to flavor. So, if, and, and let's talk about our palate. If I eat, a pig. So mm -hmm. how does my brain actually know the difference between bacon and pork? Both equally delicious, arguably, but somehow my brain knows this. What's happening? What's happening is you learn it. It's a, it's a learned behavior. Absolutely. It, it, I mean, there are some people that argue that it's hardwired, but that seems increasingly unlikely. It's a dynamic system that has the ability. Here's, the problem with it being hardwired is this. All one animal has to do is change the way it tastes and you'd never eat it. You'd quickly die. But if it's a dynamic plastic system, it, it can change as the environment changes. Um, flavor is, I like to compare it to two things. Language, you're born not knowing language. You learn, you have an incredible ability to become fluent in a very complex system that works really well. It's based on past experiences, which is the words you heard, mm -hmm. but it's dynamic and plastic, just like flavor, because you can produce sentences you've never heard before, and you can interact with people you've never met before. The other good thing to compare it to is your immune system. Your immune system also learns. The immune system you have when you're six months old is not the immune system you have now. So I think these are good examples of, of how our bodies work, that we're not just wired one way. We interact with our environment, and and our environment has an effect on us. Okay, so the, uh, none of these skills, if I can put them that way, are unique to humans. Yet, um, yesterday we talked about, you know, how the Dorito became the Dorito, and you talked about the guy who figured out the magic for making a Dorito taste like a taco, which propelled it into, you know, chip ha uh, heaven um, and, and stardom. There was another company that you talk about um, in the book about the business of flavoring. It's uh, an innovation by a company called McCormick. Yes, McCormick. Company. We yeah. know them as a herb and spice company, uh, and they're they're very good at that, but they also make flavorings. Okay, and they, they, they figured out that, hey, we can monopolize, we, we, if we give people flavorings, we'll make all this garbagey bland food taste delicious. Yes, and they're certainly not the only ones. Um, I mean, that's essentially the innovation that occurred with the Dorito, as we talked about, um, but we've done it with, you know, we can make something taste like orange. Mm. Um, this all started with the invention of the gas chromatograph. Happened, the first gas chromatograph happened, uh, went on sale in 1955, and that was an incredible boon to the flavor industry because for thousands of years, we had no idea what made food taste like food. If you take an orange, we think of it nutritionally as um, vitamin C, fiber, antioxidants. The chemicals in an orange that make it taste like an orange, uh, there's just a tiny, tiny wafer thin amount, and we never really knew what these were. The gas chromatograph finally let us figure out what they were, and as soon as we figured out what they were, we started manufacturing them. And then you can make a soft drink taste like orange. You mm. can make ice cream taste like orange, a popsicle taste like orange, candy taste like orange. You can make anything you want taste like orange. And guess what? It's delicious. Mm. This stuff works. Orange flavored candy tastes way better to a kid than just a sugar lozenge would taste. Right, because if you just gave them sugar and water, they'd whatever. be like, why? Yeah, wh it's sort of like this? pop, right? If you yes. strip down pop. If you took the flavorings out of pop, it would be sugar water. And I don't think people would drink it. So it's the flavor that they have that makes whatever, Coke, Coke, Sprite, Sprite, that, yes. that, that, we're, that our brains and, and how we've learned this stuff is what draws it to us. There's a combination here. That's right, and, it's, and this is 
it's only by understanding the connection with nutrition that this usage, this what we're doing becomes so scary. Um, I talked about the experiment with goats, but this is also happening in humans. There was a paper, and it's difficult to measure because you can't, you can't make a human phosphorus mm. deficient and say, hey, do you like the <laughs> coconut? It's not ethical, yeah. we can't do those experiments. But there was a paper in the journal Science that showed there's about, roughly speaking, 400 different flavor compounds in a tomato. But 380 of those, we just ignore. We okay. can sense many of them, but our brain just tunes it out and says, not interested. There's about 20 flavor compounds in a tomato that we really, really care about, that, what, that scientists say drive preference in a tomato. And these flavor compounds are all inextricably linked to the nutrients in a tomato, to carotenoids, to omega-3s, to essential amino acids. So what we're seeing there is the flavor of a tomato pointing right at the nutrients. Mm. It's, you might say that the flavor is a projection or like an image of the nutrients. That works really well. We love tomatoes because they're healthy. But what the gas chromatograph let us do was just say, well, let's just slice off those flavors, leave the fiber, the vitamins, the nutrition behind, and let's put that in a ketchup flavored potato chip. Let's put that in a pasta sauce, in a fast food uh, pizza or something. Mm. Um, and it works. Those chemicals still taste good. They still hit the same receptors in your nose and light up the pleasure center in your brain, but you're not delivering the nutrition. Most of the time, you're delivering a big wallop of calories. So and we're tricking our brains, basically. We're tricking ourselves, and we're tricking ourselves into eating more calories than we ordinarily would. All right. Um, I want to play a, a bit of tape. This is a, a Pringles commercial, I think. Let's roll that. Potato crisps in a tube, pop it up and get in the mood. Once you pop, you can stop. Never had a chip like this before, got to have some more. Once you pop, you can stop. If you're the type who's on the move, pump the pack with that groove too. Once you pop, you can stop. Once you pop, hey yeah. you can stop, you can stop. New Pringles. Okay, that's, you know, you pop one in, you got to eat the whole can, mm -hmm. unless you're like some superhuman person that can't, can't do it. Um, so basically it's saying these things are addictive. They <laughs> are very desirable. They're irresistible, in, in some cases irresistible in the sense that I find if I start to eat, I mean, I love Doritos. Uh, when you can't really just have one. Hmm. You, you seem to, there's this compulsion to keep eating. Um, I talk a lot about food addiction in the book. The reason I'm interested in addiction, we don't always talk about it as it is. There's a difference between something just being pleasurable and being addictive. But what's so interesting to me about food addiction, we tend to think that people that severely overeat love food too much. Hmm. It's just delicious and they can't control themselves. Con and we say, control yourselves, for God's sake, stop eating. What's interesting is when they do brain scans of people that suffer from food addictive type behavior, What's interesting is not the satisfaction that they get from the food, it's the desire they have for the food. Their desires begin to vastly outweigh the satisfaction. So let's say in a healthy eater, you know, your desire is this much and, and the satisfaction is this much, they kind of balance each other out. In a food addict, the desire is off the charts, mm. but the satisfaction is actually n relatively modest. So they get into this sort of vicious cycle of eating where food just doesn't satisfy, so they keep eating and eating. What's interesting to me is that we're hyper incentivizing food with flavorings that are telling a false story about the nutrition. And over time, we're getting into this pattern where the idea of food becomes better than the food itself. So much of the problem with junk food and fast food, and I think all food now, is that it's not satisfying. We have these dreams of delicious food, but it's actually hard to eat food that is really mm. satiating. Okay, but if we, um, just trying to pick, so foods that are addictive, usually junk food, so I can eat, like, you could, I could just eat Doritos mm -hmm. and never feel satisfied, keep eating them, keep eating them, keep eating them. If you gave me this, you know, a bunch of strawberries, at some point I'm gonna stop eating I, strawberries. I always use the example of peaches, because I, I love strawberries, but I adore peaches. I, I mean, we've all had one of those perfectly ripe peaches, which is just mm. a totally immersive experience. It pulls you in, you can't talk, there's like peach juice dripping <laughs> down your chin. But it's interesting, you can't really eat that many of those peaches. I might have two, and then I'm done. 
somehow the hunger light just goes off and you want to say to that basket of peaches, I love you, you're beautiful, <laughs> but I'm ready to move on with yeah. my day. And you don't get caught in, in this ruinous cycle of overeating. There's no what the scientists call dysphoria. You don't melt into a puddle of self-loathing after you eat delicious peaches because they're, they're satisfying in a totally different way and you feel good after you eat food like that. There's no, there's no bait and switch going on. There's no nutritional dishonesty. It's just really good. But maybe it's also because we've been told that peaches are good for us, right? And maybe, maybe it's playing on that level that we've been told, like you, no one eats 20 peaches because we've been told you eat a couple, you feel good, they taste good, it's enough. Whereas Doritos, we've never, you know, we're told not to eat, but we keep going for them. We keep eating them. We keep eating that. Is this just about like what we've been sort of mar like in terms of choice that we've been told two peaches are enough, you know, 20 million Doritos, still not enough. I think the marketing, um, the social cultural aspect, it certainly plays a role. Certain things become trendy, uh, you know, marketing budgets clearly work. But I think ultimately this is about the effect that food has on your body. If you look at fruit, there are all sorts of plant compounds in there that are on some level toxic. Everyone's freaked out about the so-called toxins in processed food. Mm. There's a ton of toxins in real food. There's toxins all over nature, but the thing to remember about toxins is it's the dose that makes the toxin. So the way your body works is it measures intake uh, as you're eating peaches, for example, and at a certain point it says you've had enough. Because we know if you eat too much fruit, you mm. will make yourself sick. Processed, we're so worried about all the chemicals in processed food, but the truth is, chemically speaking, there's not enough chemicals in processed food. A peach tells an unbelievable chemical story. There are thousands of chemicals in fruits. Our body can perceive them, and this has some effect on satiety. We know, for example, that bitter compounds um, uh, invoke satiety. If you eat bitter things, your hunger light goes off. Uh, some people think this is one of the reasons that Italians are trim, is because they're a habit of having a bitter aperitivo before they eat turns the hunger light off. There, there's a, a, a deeper chemical richness in real food. And what we've forgotten is how complex the interaction is between our bodies and nature. And we were designed to eat real food. The more we monkey around with that, the more we distort that. So we may think we've got it all figured out with, you know, you need this many carbs and this many calories, but we don't. When you eat real food, your body does a pretty good job mm. of figuring things out. All right, whenever we talk about food, now we talk about, of course, the, the rising obesity rates. You, you talk about this in the book. I'm gonna read a little quote. Here's, here's what you write, Mark. You say, we've done for, the rise in obesity is a predictable result of the rise in manufactured deliciousness. Everything we add to food just makes us want it more. And no matter how hard we try, we can't make our outsized desires go away. The percentage of slender Americans will gradually work its way down to zero. If you haven't yet bought stock in the companies that make Lipitor and sweatpants, now would be um, a good time. Lipitor is a cholesterol-lowering lowering drug. What is, the, make the connection, I mean, the one that we, between manufactured uh, flavoring and obesity, make that connection for me. If it wasn't for flavoring, so much of the food we should not be eating simply would not be palatable. Um, soft drinks are perhaps the best example. Uh, like I was saying earlier, you cannot drink a soft drink if there's no flavoring added. It would just be sugar water. The thing that's so interesting about the Dorito is that it almost flopped before they added the flavoring. The flavoring is what made it so popular. There's, there's too many flavorings now. I can't even keep track of them. They hold contests. Who's going to design the next, you know, Canada's next flavor? This stuff works. How many potato chips would we eat without the flavoring? How many fast food burgers would we eat without the flavoring? How many frozen pizzas would we eat without the flavoring? We're putting it in yogurt now. It's in ice cream. It's in herbal tea. This stuff is pervasive. My point isn't that we're eating too much Doritos. My point is we're making everything like Doritos. And we have disrupted this relationship between flavor and nutrition, and we've hyper-incentivized ourselves to eat. You know, when you walk down a grocery aisle, you see things that say, um natural flavoring. Yes. What does that mean? Uh, I would need a PhD both in law <laughs> and organic chemistry to tell you what it actually means. But the, it, the truth is it means nothing. Uh, it's not natural. It's every bit as engineered and contrived and artificial as a so-called artificial flavoring. Um, it, essentially, a natural flavor is a flavor chemical 
that is made from a natural substance using quote-unquote natural means. You might use distillation, you might put it in a centrifuge, you might, you might make it from a yeast. What you're left with ultimately is a pure chemical. So in that sense, it's not natural. Hmm. There are genetically modified yeasts that produce natural flavors. That to me is, however you feel about GMO foods, I don't see how you can call that natural. So every, anytime you see all natural flavor, it's not natural. That flavor was designed by a scientist with a PhD in organic chemistry. So be wary. Be, absolutely, be wary. All right, I want to play another clip. This is uh, Dr. Yona Friedhoff. We had him on the show last summer. Um, he, he's a doctor from Ottawa, and um, uh, and he, he kind of goes after the food industry for their mm -hmm. responsibility and all kinds of things. Um, so let's roll this tape. The food industry's responsibility as corporations are to sell food and to maximize profit. That is what corporations do. I think we as a society, and our government especially, needs to stop expecting the food industry to behave any differently. So if profits and health collide, the food industry will get on board. Of course, it's profit. Uh, but if they don't, they won't, and they will undermine it every way. And so if I'm finger pointing, although I do finger point at the industry when they're deceitful with their advertising and with their messaging, and I don't think they should be allowed to get away with that, you know, for them to sell sugar water, for instance, that's their right. But what we need to consider is whether the government should or could do anything about that. Okay, he's very clear where he, mm -hmm. you know, sort of holds all parties responsible. Where do you put the onus on when it comes to this stuff or regulating things like the obesity rate? Um, it's, I don't have the answer at this point. I think if you look at something like the tobacco industry, I think our efforts to combat it, I mean, they haven't, there's still way too many people who smoke, but I think that's helped. I think education helps a lot. Um, you know, does a cigarette manufacturer have a right to produce cigarettes? These, these are interesting questions. There's not always easy answers. The danger with legislation is the unintended consequences. Sometimes it seems really simple, but very often it's not. Mm. So we shouldn't regulate flavoring? No, I, the truth is I don't know. What I want this book to be is the start of that discussion. But I think an equally important part is just education. I think one of the best ways to get people not to smoke is to educate kids about how bad it is for you. This is what it does. This is why you like it, and this is what it does to your body. Those images of, uh, you know, like a cancerous lung on a package of cigarettes, I think that's a good idea. Food starts to, is more difficult because you don't need cigarettes to live, but you do need food. And sometimes it might seem very clear to us that this is a junk food and this isn't. But it's interesting if you look at yogurt, for example, everyone's always going on about how healthy yogurt is. There's an awful lot of yogurts now that are flavored. They have very little to no fruit in them, but they taste like fruit. They also mm. have a lot of sugar. I think these are bad things to give to kids. You alter their palate. I know once my kids got hold of flavored yogurt, they never want to eat plain yogurt again. Mm. Um, so I won't say I'm pro or against regulation until I, I have a better understanding of it, how it would work. Um, but I also think there's a responsibility on consumers. We expect our food environment to be cheap and convenient. We all have to be smarter. We all have to shop for food. I'd like to say the way an Italian grandmother shops, to have a knowledge of what is good meat, what fruits are in season, to smell a fruit before you buy it. We all want it to be easy, but the truth is some things in life just aren't easy. But here's the, the, the problem. I go to a grocery store. Again, I, I, you said, I think, yesterday or earlier in our conversation today about you could go to a farmer's market. Okay, a lot of Canadians can't do that, right, or don't have the time or, what, or the means or whatever, or there's not one that's accessible. So they go to their grocery store, and my only choice of um, tomatoes are the bland ones. Yeah, the cardboard ones. Yeah, so here's, I'm looking for the solution to all of this, right? If there's bland chicken, bland tomatoes, watery strawberries, and then there's delicious flavored Doritos and stuff like that. I mean, can we sort of right this ship and, and turn back time? If you yes, want? we can. The most depressing point in this book for me, as I said, um, I talked to you about how we've been breeding our livestock and our fruits and vegetables for output. The most depressing point in the book was this realization that there's this trade-off between quantity and quality. That essentially more delicious food is gonna cost more money. And what I realized is that basically the rich get to eat great food, but what about everybody else? Because we do have to feed them. But it turns out that that's not the way it is. The reason we lost flavor isn't because there's a direct trade-off. It's not a zero-sum game that if you have a lot of tomatoes, they are always going to be bland. The reason we lost flavor is because we ignored it. We didn't breed tomatoes to be flavorful, so flavor just kind of got lost. 
But if you do breed for flavor in a tomato, you can get flavor and keep a pretty good crop. Uh, there was a tomato that's been developed by the University of Florida. It's non-GMO. This is just a tomato that was bred like tomatoes have always been bred. It has 85% the yield of a modern commercial, you know, powerhouse tomato. It's got great disease resistance, great shelf life, and the flavor is so good that uh, the tasting panels at the University of Florida found it indistinguishable from the best tasting heirloom. This is a miracle tomato. So what we need to do is get that flavorful ethic that you find in fine restaurants and farmers markets and get it in every supermarket. Will a supermarket tomato ever be as good as the best heirloom at the farmer's market uh, in late July at the height of the tomato season? It may not be that good, but what if it's just 80% as good? What if it's just a delicious <laughs> tomato? What a boon that would be to everybody. And we can get these tomatoes on everybody's plate. And we can do that with everything we grow. The meat will probably be more expensive. A, a really good tomato will cost a bit more than a cardboard tomato. Meat, I think, will cost more. Not outrageously more, but mm. more. But the point I would make is that you eat less of it. Let's, instead of consuming too many calories, consume the right calories that are delicious calories. We have to go, but I want to ask you, um, did Dorito say anything about your book? No, I contacted them. I had all sorts of questions for them, and they just said, we won't talk to, not just to you, we don't mm. talk to anybody. That was essentially their response. So. Okay, fair enough. Thank you for talking to me. Appreciate it. Thank nice you. Nice conversation. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.